Eight months pregnant, Brooke posted an ad on a classifieds page. She and her boyfriend Charles urgently needed cash. This caught the attention of Brady Ustrike, who agreed to help them, but with a condition, they had to partake in an unusual sexual role-playing game. Brooke would be kidnapped and held to engage in sadomasochistic activities with him. After a set period, she would be released. However, on the night they met with Brady, he had other plans. He shot Charles in the head and dragged the pregnant Brooke to his private dungeon. For the next five days, Brooke endured all kinds of sexual torture while the sadist recorded everything on video. By the time the police located her, she and her unborn baby had already been killed. Authorities still refer to the case as sheer evil from start to finish. Brady Oostrike was born on December 4, 1982, in Michigan, USA, into an upper-middle-class Christian family. He was the only child of Richard and Christina Oostrike, but he had three stepsisters, Barbara, Anne, and Wendy. Brady was primarily homeschooled by his mother, though he also attended various private institutions, including the Montana Wilderness Bible School. From an early age, Brady was devout and actively involved in his local church. He even participated in church missions in countries like Italy and Ukraine. After completing his basic education, Brady trained as an electrician and began working as an outdoor electrical line installer. While this job was risky, it paid well, and Brady's skills allowed him to quickly rise to a supervisor position at his company. His earnings enabled him to buy his own house when he was just over 20 years old. Besides working as an electrician, Brady enjoyed several hobbies, especially role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. He also had a fascination with medieval weaponry, collecting swords, knives, and even guns. According to close family and friends, Brady was a kind-hearted person, always ready to lend a hand to those in need. Brady had a few brief relationships, but in 2006, he met a Canadian woman. They were together for seven years and even got engaged. However, about a month before their wedding in 2013, they separated. Brady's family did not like his fiance, accusing her of taking advantage of him. They also claimed that she refused to return the engagement ring, valued at $30,000, after the breakup. The Canadian woman later stated in an interview that the breakup was mutual and that the years she spent with Brady were good. She even described him as a teddy bear. Despite these portrayals of a sweet, kind and generous man, Brady had a dark side he struggled to hide. According to a girl who rented a room from Brady in 2012, he confided in her that he was having nightmares and violent thoughts, including the desire to harm his housemate. After hearing this, Rachel quickly moved out, but also tried to persuade Brady to seek professional help. She said Brady feared he was suffering from schizophrenia based on his online research and was terrified of people finding out. He did not want to lose his job. Brady also seemed to be suffering from paranoia, obsessing over minor inaccuracies. He began frequenting internet forums under various aliases and became engrossed in political conspiracy theories that consumed his entire life, even neglecting his personal hygiene. One of his favorite aliases was Joe Damus, an acronym for Jack of All Trades, Master of Some. His go-to site was a classified ads platform called Craigslist. It was through this platform that, on July 2nd, 2014, he struck up a conversation with Brooke, the second protagonist of this story. Brooke Slocum, like Brady, was a native of Michigan. She was born in Grand Rapids on February 17, 1996, into a large family comprising her parents, Greg and Lisa Slocum, and her six siblings, Jordan, Casey, Dalton, Katrina, Javier, and Darius. The Slocums were an ordinary family, the parents always tried to maintain household rules while giving their children the space to express themselves and grow. In Brooke's case, specifically for Greg and Lisa, it was not possible to monitor every aspect of their daughter's life. 
In 2013, Brooke met Charles Oppenier, a man several years her senior. Charles, known as Charlie to his friends and family, was originally from South Korea. However, as a baby, he was adopted by Jerry and Pat Oppenier. Born on October 6, 1988, Charles was 25 years old and already a father to two children when he met Brooke, who was just 17 and about to start her final year of high school. However, since the age of consent in Michigan is 17, Brooke and Charles started dating despite not having her family's approval. By the end of 2013, Brooke became pregnant and left her parental home to move into a rented room in a shared house. The couple did what they could to earn money and stay afloat. According to Brooke's relatives, she was deeply in love, which led her to take risky actions under Charles's influence. For instance, she would contact strangers on the internet to obtain financial resources. Sometimes Brooke received donations, but other times the money came in exchange for sexual favors. In July 2014, during a particularly financially strained period, Brooke and Charles sought help to buy gasoline for their car, and Brady offered to assist. However, his support came with strings attached. He proposed giving them what they needed in exchange for sexual services. Brady suggested meeting in a park. Initially, 18-year-old Brooke was apprehensive about the location, fearing being discovered and getting into trouble with the authorities. However, Brady convinced her it would be in a secluded area hidden among the trees. Even though Brooke was eight months pregnant at the time, they agreed to provide services to Brady in exchange for $120. They never imagined that this arrangement would cost them their lives. The couple met Brady on the night of July 13th at Gazen Park. The plan was for Brady and Brooke to engage in sexual activities in his car while Charles watched. However, upon arriving at the meeting point, Brady shot Charles, killing him instantly. He then used the confusion to handcuff Brooke and force her into his car. He decapitated Charles and hid the body among the bushes. He took Charles's head and the pregnant Brooke to his car. He drove for half an hour north of the city, threw the head into a wooded area, the skull was found five years later, and then headed to his home to begin his ritual of enslavement. Once in the basement, Brady placed a chain around Brooke's neck, which had been previously bolted to the bathroom floor, and forced her into a dog cage. He then secured her arms to a pulley system suspended from the ceiling, which he could manipulate at will, controlling her like a puppet. Additionally, the killer sadistically abused the young woman, beating her relentlessly. Each of the tortures Brooke endured was recorded by Brady's cameras and later recovered by the authorities. All of this occurred in a homemade dungeon that he had constructed, which you can see in the images I am showing you right now. While the pregnant Brooke endured unimaginable horrors, a passerby accidentally stumbled upon the young man's wallet. He notified the police, who then contacted Charles's parents, who were worried because he had not come home that night. Two days later, a patrol located a car that was improperly parked near the park. At that time, authorities were unaware that the car owner had met a grisly end and his body was hidden just a few meters away. Initially, the car did not raise any suspicions. However, after remaining in the same spot for two days, the police marked it as abandoned. Police officers visited Charles's parents' home, who reported they had not seen their son for a couple of days. Trying to gather information, the officers inquired at his workplace and learned he had not shown up there either. With Charles missing, officers returned to Gazon Park and searched the area. At 11.30 a.m. on July 16th, they discovered Charles's body but were unable to find his head. Forensic experts believed that Charles was deceased when his head was removed from his torso, but they couldn't confirm without the missing part. Investigators soon learned that Charles was dating Brooke, so the next step was to try to locate her. Brooke's roommate told the police she had last seen the couple at 8 p.m. on July 12th. She also informed them about the couple's methods for earning money. This led detectives to obtain a search warrant to review the couple's activity on the classified site. Before the day ended, investigators found Brooks' computer and handed it over to an internet crimes task force. The expert's search led them to a client, several email addresses, and ultimately to Brady. By 5 p.m. on July 17th, the detectives handling the case had all the information Armed with the name of a potential suspect, authorities staked out Brady's house that evening. 
awaiting a judge to sign the search and arrest warrant. Around 9.15 p.m., before receiving the authorization document to proceed, Brady exited his house in his yellow Chevy Cobalt and initiated a high-speed chase. As he tried to evade the authorities, he crashed his car on an entrance ramp to U.S. Highway in Grand Rapids. Before the officers could capture him, he took his own life with a gunshot. In the trunk of the car, the police found Brooks' body inside a suitcase. Shortly after, it was determined that her unborn baby was also deceased. The discovery of the young woman was just the beginning of a series of horrifying and disturbing findings by the authorities. Following the double homicide and the chase that ended in Brady's death, the police searched his house. There, they found the dungeon of terror he had constructed, which included a dog cage where he had kept his victim captive. Detectives also reviewed hours of video footage from the security cameras Brady had installed. The earliest recordings, dating back to May 5th of that year, showed him cleaning the area. There were also videos of him preparing the space and organizing all the items needed to restrain the victim and inflict suffering. The footage from the afternoon of July 12th showed Brady preparing the room for his encounter with Charles and Brooke that night, making it clear that the crime was premeditated. Authorities assumed that Brady had learned about the discovery of Charles's body and, knowing it was only a matter of time before he was linked to the crime, decided to end Brooke's life and dispose of the body. This was precisely what he intended to do on the night of July 17th when the police pursued him. The police told the media what had been discovered in Brady's house. They described it as truly horrifying and the worst case he had ever investigated. Among the official records, there was a video in which Brady recorded Brooke in the basement claiming that she, Charles, and Brady had agreed to meet for a supposed real-life capture and ransom experience. She continued saying that the plan was for Brady to hold her against her will to demand a ransom from Charles, which would be paid with play money. For the investigators, it was clear that this video, which was never broadcasted, had been rehearsed and scripted by the man in an effort to cover up his heinous actions against the couple. Finally, Brooke mentioned that the plan was to hold her for a week, but they were going to end the experience early due to her pregnancy complications. None of the evidence collected by the detectives suggested this was the true plan. The authorities never doubted that Charles and Brooke had been innocent victims of Brady. Upon hearing of Brady's death and the actions that preceded it, his family reacted with disbelief. They couldn't believe that the man they knew could do something like this. However, some people who also knew him did not respond with the same level of surprise. A woman who had been his partner for some time stated that when she lived with him, she signed sexual slavery contracts. She also mentioned that if she disobeyed him, he would chain her up and lock her in a dog cage in the basement for up to 10 hours while he went to work. Two former roommates who lived with Brady from 2005 to 2007 expressed concerns about his fascination with weapons, noting that he frequently hid knives and kept loaded guns around. They added that once one of the guns accidentally discharged, though no one was injured, the bullet went through the kitchen wall and damaged one of their car's alternator. Witnesses also described Brady as a paranoid individual with poor hygiene habits. This testimony from former roommates aligned with what detectives found when they entered his house. The home was filthy and cluttered, filled with both medieval and modern weapons. They also found a large map of the United States with several locations marked with pins. This discovery alarmed the Wyoming police, fearing the marks could relate to other crime scenes. However, after sharing this information with the FBI, investigators ruled out the presence of other victims. When asked about the map, one of Brady's ex-girlfriends confirmed that the pins marked locations where he had hidden food and weapons due to his fear of an apocalypse. Charles was memorialized on July 20th, 2014 at the North Valley Chapel in Grand Rapids. A funeral service for Brooke was held on July 24, 2014 at a community church, and her wake took place on July 30th at the Lake Funeral Home in Missouri. The case officially closed in November 2016, after which authorities released some of the surveillance videos and numerous photographs seized from Brady's house to the public. However, the police retained the most explicit and violent videos for obvious reasons. 
Throughout the two-year investigation, detectives were unable to locate Charles's head. However, on March 26, 2019, authorities identified a skull found in Kent County through dental records, confirming that Charles died from a gunshot wound. Four years after the crime occurred and three years after the case officially closed, the detectives tied up the last loose end. As a Wyoming police chief stated at the time, this crime was sheer evil from start to finish. The case was so brutal that the officers involved in the investigation had support from a special stress management team to help them cope with the horrors they witnessed. The circumstances surrounding these crimes also prompt questions about whether this tragedy, resulting in the deaths of an unborn baby and her parents, could have been prevented if Brady's deviant behaviors had been reported sooner. It also serves as a reminder of the risks associated with using online platforms to meet people or conduct certain types of transactions. That's the end of today's case. Thank you for joining us on The Crime Storyteller. If you're interested in more intriguing true crime stories, especially from Latin America, be sure to check out our new channel, Latin Crimes. Click the link to subscribe and explore more mysteries with us. See you next time.